Well, the recent numbers out for August show that actually year on year bank loans outstanding by the banks that were bailed out from the taxpayer are down 4.4%. So they're actually decreasing their lending despite what Timothy Geithner just this week in a testimony to Congress did say that they were increasing lending. But the, the numbers, actual numbers, uh, betrays his, uh, his, his lie. Right, and I, my, my fear that is that uh, now that basically with uh, Paulson's help, the banks were able to hold Congress hostage and have hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars gifted to them without any conditions or accountability, that really it's too late for any regulator or the administration in Washington to affect any reform because they've, they've missed that moment where they had some leverage. But now they have no more leverage, and there will be no banking reform. In fact, the derivatives are stacking up again right now as we speak. Hundreds of billions of derivative contracts are being stacked up in the system once again. The banks are even bigger than they were before. They were supposedly too big to fail. So the next leg of this huge crash is going to be worse than what we experienced in la last year. And you, you, now this is what you see in the U.S. dollar, Stacey Herbert. The U.S. dollar is telegraphing end of empire, end of America. And, um, you know, given the f various policies, both domestic and foreign, you have to ask yourself, is that such a bad thing? All right, Stacey Herbert, that's all the time we have for this week. Thanks for coming on. Hope to speak to you again next week. Thanks, Max. Time to travel the globe. Here we go to, oh, yes, Australia. We're going to talk with Steve Keen, who was one of the very few economists in the world who absolutely predicted the entire deflationary spiral and collapse of last year. Steve Keen, welcome to On the Edge. Hi, Max. Glad to be here. Steve Keen, inflation, deflation. The topic is raging on the blogosphere. You've got Mike Shedlock on one side. You've got Peter Schiff on the other side. Yes, it's a battle royale. Now, you wrote a book called Debunking Economics, in which you argue that economists are dangerous. What do you mean? <laughs> I've actually argued uh, in my book, uh, Debunking Economics, that I think it ought to be a better place of every economist on the planet committed collective harakiri, including me, because I think the profession as a whole, even with uh, a few people who make some sense, have done such damage to the planet that we'd be better off if the entire thing was wiped out and we handed it over to engineers to start from ground zero. It sounds like those crazy Rapa Nui people on Easter Island. They didn't understand economics, and they all became extinct. Yep. That's, I mean, if you have a... If you have a complex system and a wrong theory about how the complex system operates, at some stage it's going to come and collapse around your ears and you won't know what happened. And that's really what's been happening for the last 40 or 50 years, a, a theory of how the economy operates which abstracts from the existence of money, uncertainty and time has been allowed to rule how we think we run our actual economy and we've tinkered with the system to make it work better if there was no such thing as money, uncertainty, and time and, of course, debt. All those four things actually exist, that they're finally all coalesced at once into the financial crisis, and we have our uh, economics profession as probably the least uh, informed part of the, of the intellectual uh, world to know what the hell's happening right now. Right, and in your book and in your essays, you are describing a situation that sounds as if this crisis is even worse than the Great Depression. Explain this a little bit. Very few economists actually make any sense in the long term, include Irving Fisher. Now, Irving, of course, made himself infamous for uh, being a bull during the 1929 stock market, and in fact, four days before the major crash, making that wonderful statement about uh, stocks that Peter reached a permanently high plateau. Well, he fell off that plateau and broke his neck on the way down, to being sent effectively bankrupt. Uh, and in that state of both financial and intellectual uh, decay and confusion, tried to work out what the hell happened and look back at the theories which led him astray. And two essential assumptions he made in his previous theories uh, where he tried to increase, to extend the conventional uh, neoclassical theory of uh, commodities to include money uh, and debt were, first of all, that debts are always repaid and that the financial markets are always in equilibrium. And he realised that those were the two essential fallacies that led him astray. And, of course, the reality is the financial system is almost never in equilibrium and debts have often are not repaid, and certainly in a crisis like, like, like a depression, they're not repaid. So he built a theory called the, the uh, debt deflation theory of great depressions, and that was subsequently followed up by Hyman Minsky and built into the theory of the financial instability hypothesis, which I've worked upon. Now, 
that is a realistic vision that says you always have a system out of equilibrium. So if you're going to understand how it operates, you must be able to think in a disequilibrium fashion. And secondly, you must realise that it's feasible for financial systems to collapse by the non-payment of debt and by borrowing excessive amounts of money and speculating and losing money in that speculation. Because we then had a rebuilding of that exactly the same fallacious view of, of the world that Fisher had before the Great Depression, became the post-Second World War neoclassical theory revived over the carcass of Keynes. They built a system presuming the economy is always in equilibrium, financial markets are always accurately pricing the financial system, and every time that reality bit them and said, that's not quite the way things work, guys, they rebuilt the system as if it was the way things worked. Now, if you take a look at when that actually began, it really began at a Greenspan back in 87. Of course, he was uh, appointed only a few, a couple of... Within months before the 87 crash, he rescued, inverted commas, the financial system from that crash. If he hadn't had the rescue, I think we would have had a minor version of the Great Depression back in the late 80s. It would have been minor because the debt levels at that stage were slightly less than they were at the time of the Great Depression, and there was slightly higher inflation than there was at the time of the Great Depression. Okay, so in other words, in 1987, when the stock market crashed, there should have been a corrective mini depression to sort out the imbalances. But instead, under the Greenspan reign, they simply figured out a way to create an even bigger bubble. And this pattern has been repeated a number of times. So they kicked the can down of these incredible debt bubbles down the road a bit. But according to you, they've reached the end of that road. There is no more ability at this time to put back in place this phantasmagorical debt bubble that's going to create this fake inflation that some in the mainstream talk about. The primary theme is debt deflation, and according to you, it's achieved terminal velocity, and there will be nothing but debt, debt, debt deflation as far as the eye can see.